Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. I'm going to give to you, I'll read to you verses 1 through 4, and, uh, and then we'll get into our study. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name, than they. So let me give you some background for those who, who um, appreciate that, and then we'll move into our study. I'll just give you a brief, brief background. The, the book of Hebrews is written, obviously, to Hebrew believers. Now, it's written to Hebrew churches, and Hebrew, where Hebrew believers would be. That would include Israel. It would include what is called Asia Minor. It would include um, various portions like Greece and, and portions in that particular area in the Mediterranean, Aegean, and all of that. And so this is written to Hebrews. That's why it's referred to and has been, has been called the book of Hebrews for that reason. And you'll see as we go through this book that it, it is um, right to understand it in that fashion because it speaks an awful lot about the priesthood. It speaks concerning the temple. It, it, it speaks on things that would pertain to Hebrew believers, some of them being very solid, others who are uh, Hebrews, who are beginning to listen to the message and all. And so this book was written to them. And so the author of Hebrews, and I want you to notice, it doesn't have an author. It doesn't say Paul, or it doesn't mention a name. It simply begins by saying God who at various times. Well, the author is unknown. Uh, there are various theories. Some of you, perhaps, if you've gone through Hebrews before, have seen this or heard this. Uh, there are theories that the apostle Paul might have written it, or Apollos, Barnabas, Luke, a man named Silas, Philip, all of them have been presented as uh, possible authors. We don't know who wrote the book, but we do know the recipients, it, uh, and the recipients are those who are Hebrews. We also know that though we might not know the one God used to write the book, the recipients of the letter, well, they did. How do we know that? Well, in chapter 13, verse 23, know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. He didn't identify himself, but they knew who was writing to them, and they understood uh, that this is somebody that, that they were well familiar with. So when was it written? The time of the writing is before the year 70 A.D. How do we know that? Well, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., and the temple's destruction is not mentioned in the book of Hebrews. That tells us that uh, it was written before the temple was destroyed. Now, why was it written? What is its purpose? Well, he'll say that, and we'll see this. If you take notes, you'll see it in, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, into chapter 6, verse 1. But it was to bring the readers to spiritual maturity. Throughout the book, the author wants his readers to know a certain thing, and you're going to see this. He wants his readers to know this, that Jesus is superior, that Jesus is better. He uses the word better 13 times in this letter. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the priesthood. He's better than the law. He's better than Melchizedek. In short, Jesus is better or superior than anything and everything. Now, obviously, he'd be better than the angels because everybody's better than the angels. Anyway, um, <laughs> just a little levity. <laughs> Jesus has a better name. Jesus is a better hope. Jesus gives a better testament, a better promise, a better sacrifice. He gives us a better country, a better resurrection. And so that's the point. Jesus is better and brings everything to us at his better because he brings a better everything. And so that's basically what we'll be looking at. And so we'll begin 
as he introduces in verse 1 by simply saying, um, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. And so the author simply launches into a letter. There is no introduction. Again, I mentioned this, but this is one of the reasons why many scholars doubt that Paul wrote this epistle. When you read the letters of Paul, he identifies himself. The author does not identify themselves in this. But the point is being made that God hasn't remained silent. God has consistently revealed himself to man. Now, when he's speaking concerning this, when he says again, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, he's making it very clear that he's speaking of what would be called special revelation. Special revelation is what is necessary for us to know God. If God didn't reveal himself to us, in other words, we would never be able to know him because he's past our finding out. And so God has to reveal himself, and that's the point he's making. God, who at various times and various ways spoke in time past. So he's letting us know from the beginning that God has revealed himself to us. Somebody once said, we cannot understand God any more than an insect we may hold in our hand can understand us. And so in 1 Timothy, Paul said it in chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Uh, those verses speak of God the blessed and the only ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. So God has to reveal himself. God dwells in unapproachable light, and he's revealed himself to us. And he's saying he did this in various times and in different ways. He's saying that God revealed himself piecemeal over time. Now, when he's saying that, God in various times, in various ways, God has revealed himself slowly, piece by piece. He's most likely referring to the testimony of the Old Testament. You see, the 39 books of the Old Testament were written to reveal him to us. And so in different ways, verse 1, God has revealed himself. So he's revealed himself through various means. He used dreams, visions, angels. Events, symbols, signs. He used his prophets. So in different ways, God has revealed himself to us over time. He says in verse 1 that he spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Now, when it speaks of being uh, uh, revealing himself to the fathers, the fathers is another way. Again, we're, we're thinking of the Jews who are receiving this. Hebrews who are, are receiving this. They would be thinking of what are called the, the patriarchs. The patriarchs are the ancestors of the readers of the letter. They are Jews looking back at their forefathers. And so God has used various means of revelation, but he especially has revealed himself through prophets. In Numbers 12, 6, it says there that God said, Listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. So these prophets that God reveals himself to, we're moved by God to write scripture. And that's why Peter has said in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the writer is telling us that God piecemeal through the 39 books of the Old Testament, especially through the prophets, has revealed himself to us. And he moved these writers of the Old Testament to give to us insight concerning the God of the universe. So God has used various means, including prophets, to reveal himself to man. But as great as that is, he did something even greater. It says in verse 2, he has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So no prophet in the Old Testament ever had the entire revelation of God. Now, the Old Testament is without error, but it was pointing to the future. The Old Testament prophets were speaking of and writing of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And that's, a call, that's called progressive revelation. And it was preparing the people for Messiah, for the Son. And so he's saying his full and his perfect revelation awaited the coming of Jesus Christ. 
That's what you see in the introduction of the Gospel of John in chapter 1, verse 1. When it says, in, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the full and perfect revelation of the Word of God is Jesus Christ. Now, this is the difference between Christianity and demonic counterfeit religions. God reveals himself to man. Man does not find God by his own efforts, and man does not create a system of finding God. You need to understand that. People have argued, out, well, there's many religions, and, you know, and there are hundreds and this and that. No, there are two. There are two religions. There is God's, which is truth, and there's the satanic counterfeits that come under the banner of one false doctrine. Because the false teachers all have one thing in common. They deny Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. And so there is one true faith, and that's Jesus Christ. We saw that in the book of, of uh, Ephesians when, when Paul spoke of that. And so the world was being prepared by the prophets to receive Messiah. And God has revealed himself. Man cannot find him by searching. In Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27... All things are delivered to me by my Father. No man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father except for the Son, and he to whomever the Son will reveal him. And so you by searching will not find him. He actually makes himself apparent to you. He reveals himself to you. And he does that by the gifts, by the, rather by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God and the declaration of who Christ is through the proclamation of what we call the gospel. And so he says in these last days, verse 2, he has spoken to us. Now, the last days speaks of what is referred to as the days of Messiah. The last days, you might find interesting, began at Pentecost. In, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, after that, Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had descended on the 120 there in the upper room there in Jerusalem, and, and, uh, and, and Peter begins to preach. It says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams, which I do quite often now. <laughs> but that's what was spoken of by the prophet Joel in the last days. So the last days actually begin at Pentecost. In 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21, it says, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. And so in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. What does that mean? In these last days, God has given his final revelation. There's no new way that God will reveal himself to us. There's no new way. In Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 3, Paul said it like this. He said, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There is no new message. There is no new gospel. There is no new prophet. None of that is true. In the New Testament, it simply makes it clear. God has in these last days spoken to us by his son, his final revelation. And that's what, what he's pointing to. And as he does so, he begins to describe Christ. And I want you to see this. He says, uh, verse 3, Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And so he gives to us a description. One, notice how he says he was appointed heir of all things. The psalmist in Psalm 2, verse 8, says it like this. Ask of me, and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. That was a promise to Messiah. Romans eleven thirty six: For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. He was appointed heir of all things. Second, through whom also he made the worlds. The created universe, space and time, was created by Jesus Christ. 
In John 1, 3, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And so through whom also he made the world. He has appointed heir of all things through whom he made the worlds through. Verse, uh, verse 3, uh, third, who being the brightness of his glory. When it speaks of the brightness of his glory, that that word there that is usually used to describe it in the Old Testament would be the Shekinah glory of, 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 of God, the Shekinah. Uh, I used to think it was Chicano, but it's not a Shekinah. <laughs> I was wrong. The brightness, the Shekinah of his glory, his glory speaks of his divine nature. He is, now I want you to see this, who being the brightness of his glory. What is he saying? Jesus is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. Jesus is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. He took upon himself human flesh. In John 1, 14, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. But he goes on, the word became flesh. And so the writer of Hebrews is showing us that Jesus is the brightness of his glory, the visible manifestation of the invisible God. And that's what he goes on to say uh, again in verse 3 when he says the express image of his person. The word express image, image uh, is the word, uh, the, uh, the character. It, it is the exact expression of any person or thing in every respect. All that God is in human flesh, the writer is saying, Jesus is. Jesus is God in an essential nature. In Colossians 1.15, it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And what does he do? He says, upholding all things by the word of his power. He is saying that he holds all things together. He is the preeminent power. He is the sustainer of the universe. There used to be a guy who was called the master of the universe, but he isn't. It's Jesus. He's the sustainer of the universe. Again, Colossians 1.17 he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus holds everything together is the point. He upholds all things. How? By the word of his power. So this one who is he's referring to, God in the flesh, a sixth thing he says is by himself purged our sins. He cleansed us. He removed our sin. We need no other savior is what he's saying. No other could do what he has done, and he did it by himself. He did it alone. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, we saw this, how that Peter said, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. How did he purge our sin? Peter said he did it by his blood. John, in 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then it says he sat down. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Um, an aside, you see the term right hand used often in Scripture. It's used over 100 times in the Old and New Testament. The right hand, the right hand is the place of power, honor, and authority. In Exodus 15, verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In Mark 16, 19, Mark writes, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. And so this is a place of honor. This is a place of power. This is the place of of authority, And so he's pointing out that Jesus is better in his introduction. And then he goes on and says it, verse 4, having become so much better than the angels 
as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, having become would speak of the incarnation. You see, he's already pointed out in verse 1, it spoke of the prophets, that he's better than the prophets, but now he is pointed out to be superior to the angels. So become would speak of the incarnation. Prior to his incarnation, Jesus, as eternal son, was already better than the angels. But in his incarnation, theologians will point out that he took a second nature. He became man. And in his time on earth as man, he was a little lower. He was a little lower than angels in the sense that he was limited himself from all that he was prior to his incarnation. And the reason that he had become incarnated was for the purpose of suffering and death as our substitute. Now, after his ascension, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. So after completing redemption, once again, he's exalted and preeminent. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 says it like this, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee shall bow. I always get caught up with this. I have to protect myself from doing it. I've got a lot to teach today. But that simply means everybody. That includes Buddha. That includes Muhammad. That includes every person who ever portrayed themselves as a prophet of God that was not a follower of God through the Jewish faith and the Messiah Christ. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So he is better. Verse 4. When it says he's better, that word Better means to be more excellent or superior. He is better or superior, more excellent than the angels. Now, let me share a few things about this. This is where I stopped the last time I taught this book. So I have to rush here. The Jews. The Jews considered angels to be incredibly important throughout their history. Some believe that the angels... Uh, were present with, with God as he was completing creation. That's how they interpreted Genesis 1, 26, where it says, let us make man in our image. And so there are those Jewish people who considered angels to be important and that they were present when God completed creation. And they would say, see, who was he speaking to? Well, he was speaking to angels, is what they said. Now, I'm giving you that side to tell you that's not right. God didn't consult with angels when he created. How do we know that? Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. So he did not include the angels in creation. He says, I did it. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, for by him, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. So he is superior to the angels. The angels did not create. Jesus is the creator. When the Godhead, when he said, let us make man in our image, he was speaking within the Godhead. He was not speaking to angels. He was referring to uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Now, angels are mentioned 273 times in the Bible. There are 108 direct references in the Old Testament, 165 in the New. And let me give you a few things about angels. One, they were created before man. How do we know that? Because the fall of Satan occurred in heaven before man. Second, 
They don't have bodies of, of flesh and bone. Third, they can visibly appear in human form. We see that in various times in Scripture, including when the angels announce the resurrection. Fourth, they do communicate. They communicate to men. Remember how Gabriel spoke to both Joseph and Mary. Uh, fifth, the angels that did not fall reside in heaven. Revelation 5.11 says, I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircle the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And then six, as great as they are, believers are superior in the plan of salvation. The scripture tells us, and you'll see this when we close this chapter, that the angels actually are ministering spirits who are there to minister to heirs of salvation. And so, speaking of that, he's pointing out in verse 4 that he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, when it says a more excellent name, it's not just the name Jesus, as if the name is superior to, we'll say, Michael or Gabriel. No, what he's saying is that his name is more excellent. And how, do, how does he show us that? Verse 5. To which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And so, to which? In other words, God never said to any angel, today I've begotten you. Incidentally, and this is an aside, and I'm not going to go deeply into this one. This answers the... Um, the teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses who say that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel. They will teach you that. I've had numerous conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses over the years, and, and they will tell you that, that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Well, the question is being asked, uh, to which of the angels did he ever say, you're my son? The answer is, only to Jesus did he ever say that, not to an angel. And he's speaking of God, declaring Jesus to be his son. And how did he demonstrate that Jesus is his son? He did that through the resurrection. How is Jesus declared to be the son of God? Through the resurrection. In Acts 13, 32 and 33, we tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, he's fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son Today, I have become your father. So it's pointing to his resurrection. That's why Romans 1, 4 says that Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. And so to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? To none of them. Why did he refer to Christ as my son? Because Jesus died, was buried but resurrected. And when Jesus was resurrected, he was demonstrating himself to be the son of God. And that's why verse 5 says, I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. Originally, these words were spoken to, spoken of David's son who would reign, which was a prophetic uh, uh, portrait of Messiah. They didn't refer to Solomon. They refer to David's greater son, Jesus, who is the son of David. But, verse 6, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. He is superior. He is more excellent. Notice this. These are very important things to, to remember. The angels of God are commanded to worship Jesus. The Bible is very clear. Only God is to be worshiped. In Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Isaiah 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory. I will not give to another, nor my praise to graven images. To which of the angels did God ever say, worship them? The answer is to none. Angels are created beings. Angels are not worship. They are not to be given what belongs only to God. Worship. Remember in Revelation 19, verse 10, how John was overwhelmed with all that he was receiving, the apostle John. And in Revelation 19, verse 10, John says, I fell at, at his, at the angel's feet, to worship him. 
And he said to me, see, you do not do it. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. So to which of the angels, and he's telling us Jesus is greater. He is superior to them. To which angel did he ever say worship? And the answer is to none. He never commands us to worship angels. He never commands us to go to angels and to, 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 uh, to pray to them. I was raised in a system that prays to angels. Many of you were. I was raised in the Catholic Church. We would pray to Gabriel. We would pray to, uh, pray, uh, pray to Michael and, and all of that. There were other angels that were named Raphael and others. And so I was taught to pray to them, but the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't say that I should go to them. They're not my intercessors. We worship Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's God in human flesh. Notice how it says in verse 6 that he is the firstborn. The firstborn is a messianic title. It's not a, a title. It's not referring to time. It's referring to superiority of position. Uh, Genesis 48, 17 through 19. I'll give you an example. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. He held up his, he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put your right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a, a people. He also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he. His seed shall become a multitude of nations. So this is a picture not in priority of birth, not that you have an older brother and you're the second born. It's a priority in terms of your position. And he's pointing Christ out as being the Messiah. He's the firstborn. He is superior. In Psalm 89, 27, God said he would make David his firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. And so Jesus is the son of David through the ancestry of David, he is the great one and the greatest one. And so it says, let all the angels of God worship him. Now, they will worship him. Why? Because he's God and they owe it to him. Revelation 5, 11 and 12. I looked, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and might, honor, and glory, and blessing. Let all the angels of God worship him. Well, verse 7 says of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And so, verse 7 tells us of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits. Who makes? He's superior. Because of his superior nature. That again reveals the difference in the basic nature of angels and Jesus. He makes. The word makes speaks of created. He created the angels' spirits, his ministers, a flame of fire. The angels were created, but Jesus is God and was never created. He created the angels so that they would carry out his will. But, he says in verse 8, to the Son, he said, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The writer speaks to Jesus as God. I want you to see that. You might want to mark that. Jesus is God. And the throne he occupies is eternal. He is forever Lord. He is our sovereign ruler. Remember Isaiah 9, 6? We will quote that during Christmas. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The throne Jesus occupies is eternal. Jesus is God in the flesh. That is the overwhelming testimony of Scripture. There are quite a number of people who attempt to reduce Christ to a good man or a teacher. 
Um, some will even dispute whether or not he actually existed in history. And there are others who will say that he was a prophet. But he's more than that. He's those things and, and, and greater. He, he is a, a prophet. He, he is a good man. He is a wonderful teacher. He has all of those. He, he does all of those things and is all of that. But the overwhelming testimony of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And that, again, is where you'll have arguments and disputations with people who want to say that he's simply a prophet. If you ever have the opportunity, and some of you have had to speak to a Muslim, they will tell you, oh, no, we honor him. We respect him. He's a prophet. That's what they'll call him. And yet, and yet the things that Jesus said... If, he, if he's not God in the flesh, then he's a false prophet because he demands worship. He commands worship. And there are so many things that he commands in his, in his word to us that there's no way. I mean, he said, that he, he said in the Gospel of John, he said that, uh, that, that he, he will receive worship even as his father does. There's, there's, he, is, he and his father being one, which caused them to want to, the Jews to want to stone him because he said that his father and he were one and all and and he called God his father, making himself equal with God. That's why Jesus was crucified, because they believed that because they understood what he's saying. He's saying, I'm God in the flesh. And they got upset about that. And so you, you can't reduce Christ to just a prophet, a good man or a great teacher. He, he's God. And, and that he is God is overwhelming testimony. In Titus 2.13, it says, looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested. God was made visible in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. And so Jesus is God in the flesh, and he has a scepter, meaning he has power. Now God, verse 9 he says, has anointed you with the oil of gladness, gladness. He has a relationship with his father that is unique. That's why it's referred to here as God, your God. God the Father is the one who anointed Jesus, God the Son. He is the God of Christ as a man. He prepared and formed Jesus' human nature. In Hebrews 10.5, it says, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but a body you have prepared for me. So as fully human, Jesus is anointed. He is the Messiah. The word Messiah in Hebrew, Mashiach, speaks of the anointed one. So Jesus was anointed. He didn't have a sin nature. Sin nature is inherited through Adam. He had a human body derived from Mary, but he had his father's nature. In Scripture, um, I like to tease and say that my children are sinners because they're like their mom. <laughs> but that's teasing because human nature is actually, it is looked at as being actually obtained from the father. And so because Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, he received his physical body from Mary. But his nature his divine nature was from his father. That's how he could be God, the son. And he didn't have a sin nature because his nature is derived from his father who has no sin. So the human body was from Mary, but the nature is from his father. And so being fully human, Jesus is able to give his life as a substitution for us. And he understood human weakness, but was without sin. So as God in human flesh, he was anointed Messiah. He is the anointed one. In Acts 10, 38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And then finally, Verse 10, following. I'm telling you, this is making me tired just to do this. The Lord in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. 
They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up. They will be changed, but you are the same. Your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? He is superior because of his superior existence over all creation. It says again in verse 10, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. Jesus predates angels, and Jesus obviously outlasts all creation. Creation itself is described as being rolled up like a garment. In Isaiah 51, verse 6, uh, six it says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. Or 2 Peter 3, verse 10, The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. He is superior. He laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of his hands. But he said in verse 11, they will perish. You, he says, will remain. They will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up. They will be changed. But you are the same. Your years will not fail. He is forever. He is everlasting. And then finally, <clears throat> he is superior because he has a greater destiny than the angels. He conquers all of his enemies, and everything in the universe ultimately worships him. Uh, incidentally, that, that keeps me going in the days that we live in. That keeps me going. You know, I've said this before. You know, when my kids were small, I'll use it as an illustration, but when my kids were small, they, 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 weren't, always, they weren't always everything I, I wanted. Sometimes I looked at them, and I said, did I really pray for you? Did did. did. <laughs> They have your mother's nature. Again, did I? I wish they all, I wish they were like you. And they'd go through their times, and they went through their struggles, and they went through their hard, hard points. One of them told me one day, well, Dad, I'm, I'm fashioning my own testimony. And I said, you, I, you don't understand. The way that I raised you was intended to keep you from having your own testimony. The way that I raised you, I didn't want you to have. Well, Dad, you have a testimony. Yeah, and I don't want you to have mine. You see, a lot of times, and you parents know what I mean when you say that. You know, sometimes we'll see somebody and we'll, we'll, we'll admire the testimony of this person. We'll say, my goodness, that, that, that person really was this and was really that. And, and it, it's almost as, as if you admire their sinfulness. It, it's true. I mean, sometimes people will give their testimonies and it's like, and, and I beat him and then I shot him and then I tattooed him. No, no, that's a movie I saw one time. Um, and you see that, and, and you think, oh, man, what? I don't have a testimony. I was raised in a Christian home. I went to you know, church all my life. I, I never experienced those things. And instead of rejoicing over that, they think that you were ripped off. It, it's people like me who wish I was like you. Who say, I wish I didn't know that. I wish I hadn't experienced that. I wish I hadn't gone there. I, I wish those things were not part of the things I still die to, to this day. To this day. Right? And so I didn't want my kids to have a testimony like mine. But sometimes they go through their own things. Nothing you can do. You do your best and they decide what they're going to do. A lot of times you have broken heart over it. A lot of times you, you tear up and you feel like a failure and you wonder where you went wrong. And the Lord had to teach me something and I'll share a couple things with you. He had to teach me that he wasn't through with them. That he had a work he was going to do in them. 
and the end was going to be beautiful. So I learned to teach my kids this. I said, your life is a book. You have various chapters. And some of the things you're going through right now will be a chapter in that book, a book of your life. But I want you to know something about that book. As a believer, it ends up good. At the end of that book, it's going to say in the very last line, and he lived happily ever after. It's a good ending because your ending in Christ will always be good. So don't, don't get caught up in the process. Just learn those things and see at the end, at the end, when, when, when you see the ministry of Christ, it, it, there are those who say he was a failure. When you look at some of the great uh, men of Scripture, I'll give you an example. Uh, look at Paul. Paul, when he got saved, Paul traveled through the, the known world at his time. He went all around planting churches. We know that we went through the book of Acts. And you see him going from this place to that place, from this place to that, moving, moving, moving. And he does so for many years and plants many churches and, and writes 13 letters. And there's never been another man like Paul, the greatest evangelist the world ever knew. It's the Apostle Paul. He's a man who wrote, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the most beautiful chapter on what love is in 1 Corinthians 13. He describes it for us. He tells us things about it. He knew love, and he loved people. He was a man who, who traveled the world to speak of Christ, went through many pains and many sufferings, many challenges. And yet he said, the greatest concern I have is not the fact that I've been shipwrecked or I've been in the deep or I've been beaten. My greatest burden is my concern for the church. And I get inspired by him. A man who closes the book of Romans by listing off name after name after name. A man who you see in his letters him Say hi to this person. Give my blessing to that person. He knew a lot of people in a lot of places and was loved by a lot of people. And yet, what does he say in 2 Timothy chapter 4 when he's concluding? He says, everyone has forsaken me. So he must have been a failure, right? Everybody forsook him. I only have a handful of people who have remained faithful. No, he wasn't a failure because it, ends out good. it ended up good with him. We still read his, his letters, and all of the evangelism and ministry is being added up to his, his crown, to his reward. And Jesus looked like a failure. One of his most trusted men, a man by the name of Judas, that was so trusted that none of the others would believe that Judas could be Judas. And there are those who say, well, Jesus failed. I mean, look what happened to him. He got betrayed. Even his closest friends forsook him in the garden. And the women came to watch him crucified. And there was only one apostle there by the name of John. Everybody else was in hiding for fear of the Jewish authorities. What a failure. And to the side of the world, the fact that this man was betrayed and rejected and killed. In the side of the world... They would say, what a failure. But three days later, he was raised from the dead. And all that he did was validated by his resurrection. And he is greater. He conquers. He conquered death and he'll conquer his enemies. And the entire universe worships him. In Philippians 2, again, verses 9 through 11, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You are the God of the universe. You are greater than angels. They're ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. 
but you are the Savior. You are greater. And so chapter 1, the theme of chapter 1 is Jesus is greater.